Uh, Welcome, by the way, if you're new here today, so glad to see you. Uh, We believe that the Lord has brought each of us here, and I say that because we intentionally pray. We pray for the service. We pray that God would continue to draw people to himself. We pray that his spirit would move among us, among many things. We pray that God would bring people. And so you are here today. Okay, so, well, I'm the one that chose to get up. You did, okay? However, the Lord is the one that is drawing you. And so we have prayed for this service, and we're going to dive into our passage this morning. And in this passage, I am asking us, as Margie has stated, to answer really three important questions. And you can say, well, you know, I know the answers to these questions. I know what's happening in my heart. But I want us, and I've been praying for this this week, to really think about this. Who indeed do you say Jesus is? Now you say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm here. Well, we're going to dive into that question to look at its implications this morning from our passage. I'm asking you a question this morning that I want you to think about. What are you thirsty for? And I'm not talking about physical drink. I'm talking about what do you long for in your heart? And there's a variety of things that our heart seeks. And we're going to talk about that this morning. And thirdly is whose glory are you seeking? That from people towards yourself or that from yourself towards God? Now, I know in this context, I'm speaking primarily to believers, but these questions are relevant for our lives as well, because their implication matters in how you orientate your life and how you live while you're on this side of eternity. And the answers to those questions matter for eternity. So this is where we're going today as we continue our series in the Gospel of John. If you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open up to John chapter 7. We're going to pick up this series in verse 25. I'll have the verses up here. I'm in the NIV version this morning. There's Bibles right in front of you, NIV, if you want to follow along there or on your phones or whatever, whatever you do. And to bring us up to speed, especially if you are new here this morning, Jesus is in the middle of a festival of tabernacles, speaking and teaching uh, to those who are gathered there. Now, right before this, his brothers were trying to convince Jesus what Jesus should do in his ministry. We talked about that last week. They're saying, hey, Jesus, don't just hang out here in Galilee up north where, you know, kind of backwoods. But, man, if you want to become like a popular figure, then you have to do your stuff in the big city, the Mecca, the heart of Israel. You're supposed to go down there. Jesus said, hey, you know what is this conversation? You know, any time is good for you. I'll go on the right time. And right before that, the crowds were swelling because he um, fed the 5,000. There's probably 20,000, 30,000 people there. He'd walked on water, done all these miracles. And there's high tension in the land. Everyone was looking for this rabbi. Where is Jesus And some had already um, decided on his identity. Some believed, indeed, that this was the Messiah. They were convinced by his works. They were convinced by his teaching. And they wanted to follow him and worship him. Now, on the other extreme was the religious leaders, the kind of the guard of what was sacred, the guard of orthodoxy, the guard of the law of Moses in which their society was built upon. These were those who were in the temple, those who were teaching in synagogues, and they had a very different opinion. You would think that they would be the first to recognize the Messiah, but they were the last, and some of them never did. 
And they concluded that this man, Jesus, who called himself God, was a lawbreaker, a sinner. Worse than that, he was deceiving the people. And they concluded he needs to die. Now, in the middle, of course, there was a group of people who were undecided. And they were talking, and they were debating, and they were wondering, and they were kind of anticipating who this man was. And in that context, Jesus continues to minister. And as we saw last week, and where we ended off uh, in verse 24, was this, where Jesus said, Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead... Judge correctly. And so Jesus spoke this to all of those who are making a decision about his identity. And Jesus speaks this through his Holy Spirit to us now. Don't judge him particular, others secondarily, by mere appearances. But judge, determine, make a decision on who they are rightly or correctly. This is the hinge verse in this teaching as Jesus is up on the steps, more than likely in the epicenter. He did go down to Jerusalem in the middle of the week, not in the beginning, and was teaching. And he said this to the crowd who had gathered to hear him. Hey, judge correctly, rightly as to indeed who he is. So this is what's happening in this passage, and we're going to finish it out this day, and next week we'll turn to an interesting passage. I'll talk about that at the very conclusion. So let's pick this up now midstream per se, as Jesus is teaching right after he said, judge correctly. We're going to pick it up in verse 25. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem, they began to ask, wait a second, isn't isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is, speaking publicly. And they, their leaders, are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. And when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. By the way, (laughs) that was a popular understanding at the time, kind of on folk theology, okay? Verse 28. Now, then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I'm from. I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him. And he's talking about his father. But I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. (laughs) Now, those who are listening, by the way, especially the authorities, they knew exactly what Jesus claimed. And he told them, hey, you don't know the father, the one that you think you worship through the law of Moses. You have missed the Father because you missed me. I and him are one, and I am speaking to you is the Son of God. And they, when Jesus said, hey, you don't know him. You may know where I'm from, but you don't know who sent me, right? Oh, did it irritate the religious leaders, right? Verse 30, at this, right? Now they're like, "Mm, we can't take this anymore, right? At this, they tried, to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. You see this tied into his life that the sovereignty in God and the timing of God would not be thwarted. Now, as they were trying to seize him, verse 31 then brings this contrast, still many in the crowd believed in him, which is the purpose of this gospel. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? 
Here's our first question that I'm asking you to truly think about. Who do you think Jesus is? So as you can see, many of the days of Jesus, when Jesus was physically present, they were divided in their judgment about who Jesus was. Again, some were convinced, others were confused, others were um, um, wanting to kill him, and there was all of these things that were happening, all of these opinions that were present. It was true when Jesus was physically present, and it is very true in our day as well. Again, if we took a microphone and we did a man-on-the-street type of interview and we stopped people at random, even in our city, and asked them, who do you think Jesus is, there's going to be a variety of opinions. And if you're in college towns, there'll be perhaps a certain way, and retirement communities, perhaps a certain way. But even in our time, people had varied understandings of who Jesus is. And there is a variety of answers from he is Lord, sovereign, God of the universe, to he is deceiver, to mostly in the middle. Well, he was a good moral teacher or even a prophet. Upcoming, I'm taking another class for my next degree and I'm going through C.S. Lewis. And so a couple weeks ago, I read all my textbooks. And by the way, C.S. Lewis, if you don't know him, written about 30 books, brilliant thinker. You're probably best known for his children's books, Chronicles of Narnia. You're familiar with those, right? That's not the only books he wrote, by the way. <laughs> Screwtape Letters is probably another most famous. And perhaps, well... I would say the most influential, at least on my life, is a book called Mere Christianity that talks about his apologetics as he reasons through the things of Christianity as he was once an atheist and became a born-again Bible-believing professor at Oxford. It's an incredible book that helped me originally come to faith when I was 17 considering these things. And I just reread it. I'm like, wow, this is a really good book, right? And I recommend it to you. And as I was preparing for this message this morning, a passage that I read in Mere Christianity came to the surface. And I have it in your notes. And I'm going to read this. It's about a paragraph that he's thinking through Jesus' life and claims. And it is powerful, well-written, and confrontational to us as well. So this is what he wrote. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, which is Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Now, that is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You, by the way, I love the turning of pages. That was a, that was a very <laughs> precious moment to me right there. I'm just going to bask in this. Oh, so lovely. So lovely. Someone reads those things. Okay. <laughs> All right. You must make your choice. I must make my choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or he's a madman, or 
do something even worse. Now, you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. I just got goosebumps up here. And I don't think it's from the air conditioning. Often in our society, in our Americanized, Westernized, um, overeducated in some ways, thoughts. We view Jesus as a good moral teacher. Those who think that have not read the Gospels well. Right? Does Jesus give us good moral teaching? Oh, he does, but so, so much more. He claimed to be God. He claimed that he was the judge. He claimed to have all authority over heaven and earth. He claimed to be the bread of life and said, come to me. He claimed to be the source of living water. He claimed to be the the way, the truth, and the life. And he said that no one comes to the Father yet through me. Those are incredible words. Those are unbelievable claims. Jesus did not just teach us to bless those who persecute us. right? He told us to believe in Him. Now again, in our society, in our Christian, westernized, modern America, people have opinions about Jesus. And they know a lot, perhaps, about Him. But there's a difference between knowing things about Him and believing in Him and His claims that He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. What you think about Jesus matters. It has serious implications. Who do you say he is? Is he indeed the Savior of the world? Is he indeed the Christ, the Son of God? If you believe that, then you reorientate your life from following your desires and your will, and you abandon those things, ask for a new heart, ask for your cleansing of your sin, and decide to walk in his footsteps Follow him, obey him, and make him known. You reorientate your life in that direction. If he's just a good moral teacher, then you can either take it or leave it. Right? Well, maybe I'll bless my enemies, but I'd rather curse them. Or, you know, I just want to add Jesus to my life so he will bless me, but I want to do my own thing. Is that the option that that he left us? If he indeed is the one who's coming back, if he indeed is the one in which we must give an account, if he is indeed the one that commanded us, to teach the nations to obey everything 
he taught that matters. We need less, quote-unquote, Christians who believe Jesus is a good moral teacher. We need more people who recognize that he is the sovereign Lord of the universe. It means you think differently, you live differently, you're orientated differently. Looking to be like him as the Holy Spirit works in us, conforming us into the image of his son. Where are you at today? Is he the Lord? (laughs) Have you determined that? Or perhaps you're on the fence. Continue to investigate. None of you in here, I would think, are wanting to do away with Jesus because you're here. Make this personal today. What he said matters today and for eternity. This is why we continue to read the scriptures. This is why we continue to study the Bible. This is why we worship him. Ask for his Holy Spirit to move among us. Help us to see, renew us, strengthen us, convict us, empower us, these things. Who do you say Jesus is? Because it matters. Someday, as Jesus has predicted, every knee will bow. Everyone will see both the living and the dead. This question that they were chewing on in his day is a question we must chew on in our day. Judge correctly. Choose whom you will serve. No one teaches like Jesus. No one has done what Jesus has done. No one has made the claims that he has, no one has risen from the dead, resurrected like him. Think about it and look at the implications. Let's continue on, right? All of these questions, would the Messiah do more than this man? Let's continue this passage, this conversation. The Pharisees, if you're not familiar with that, these are religious leaders, the high council. The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about them, about him. They were listening to the crowd and they were wondering what they were saying. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees, they sent temple guards to arrest him. They didn't have Roman guards, but they'd have guards around the temple, okay, Go get him now. And off went these men to arrest him. Verse 33. Jesus said, I'm with you for only a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me, which was his father. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we can't find him? Will he go where people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? (laughs) Still did not get him. He was saying that he was going to be dead, going to the Father, and they're not going to be able to find him then, right? But he'll be back, right? These guys did not understand what he was saying prophesying. Now, this arrest warrant was out, and then on the last day of the festival, and this is important, and we're going to talk about this in a second. Verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty Come to me and drink. 
Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Now by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Now up to that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Verse 40. Now in hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. Still others ask, wait a second, how could the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not Scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus, the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him. But no one laid a hand on him. So this is the next question. What do you thirst for? Now again, we all thirst for something, right? What you thirst is what you pursue. Okay. Some in our society search or thirst for power. They want more power and they will do anything to obtain it and keep it. Some thirst for riches and do everything they can to get some more money right? and to keep it. Others search for value, yet others are love or acceptance. And to do anything they can to obtain it. Again, our thirst and our hunger goes way beyond physical. Right? This thirst does not stem from our stomachs, but it stems, comes from our hearts. What are you seeking most? What are you desiring, greatest, to be happy, to be known, to be wealthy, to be popular, whatever it is, <laughs> to have people leave you alone, perhaps? Right? What is it? Now, I want to set this passage up by this understanding, verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the festival. Now, we have to pay attention to that. Now, if you don't have time, you, I just, you, know, you just read through that and like, yeah, whatever, okay? But we have to stop and think about what was taking place, okay? In your notes, I have a detailed description. Bless D.A. Carson, put it together for us. But I'm going to paint this picture. So this is the Festival of Tabernacles, or it's called the Festival of Booths. Okay, it was acquired of the people of, of God, those in Israel, to come to Jerusalem, come to the temple, and to celebrate this week-long festival. Right? It's a festival celebrating God's provision of them when they were in Egypt, uh, excuse me, in the desert from Egypt to the Promised Land, and how God took care of them. They were to remember this. So they set up little tents or booths or tabernacles where they lived and they celebrated God's goodness and faithfulness in anticipation of him sending the Messiah. Okay, And on the last and greatest day of the festival, this is where the crowds were at their highest. There was a ceremony and there was a parade, right? And everyone was supposed to, to uh, jump in it. And so the, the high priest would go and get a golden jar. This is the best I have, right? They would grab this golden pitcher, and they would process from the tabernacle 
out to the, the pool of Shalom outside of the walls. They would dip the water. Everyone was following them, right? With fruit in one hand and these things that make noise in the other hand representing God's thing. They would grab this water. They would turn, go back into the city through the water gate holding this pitcher of water that symbolized God's care for them. They would march up the stairs of the temple, the crowds would be gathering for this moment. And they would circle the altar and the choir would be singing certain psalms. And they would hold these things and they would hold up the pitcher and they say, give thanks to the Lord. Three times, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord. And then the high priest would pour the pitcher of water out and they had the daily offering of wine which symbolized the Holy Spirit and God's provision pointing to the Messiah and they would pour it out on the, wa- on the, on the uh, altar, pour it out in front of God as a sign of worship and of faith. And in that context, Jesus steps up and says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me As Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Do you understand what Jesus was saying? As all of this crowd was looking towards God as their source of living waters, Jesus stands up and says, Come to me! I am He! I am the one who has these waters. Could you imagine being there in the the crowd and beholding this? And looking and says, yes, and then some guy over here stands up and says, come to me, all you who are thirsty. He is saying that he is God. He is the one that pours out the living waters. This is what Jesus was saying when he said this statement at this time, at that place, on that day. If you understand that, this makes a whole lot of more sense. It's like, listen. If you are thirsty for God, if you are thirsty for eternity, Jesus says, come to me. I am the source of living waters. Come to me. I am going to give you the Holy Spirit. Incredible statement. And some who heard heard this said, surely this is the prophet. Surely this is the Messiah. And the priests, ripping their robes, saying, blasphemy. This statement is huge. And the invitation continues this day. Jesus saying he is the source of the living waters, of eternal life, of the Holy Spirit. We get this only from Him and all who are thirsty, come. So the question is, are you thirsty for eternal life, for the Holy Spirit, for God's life in you? Because people who don't want those things but thirst for fame or fortune or popularity, or whatever, don't come to Jesus. They drink from some other fountain. And all the fountains we have, this world offers, are poisonous, unfulfilling, and detrimental. So the question I have, what are you thirsty Are you hungry and thirsty for God? Then go to Jesus. 
If you're looking for new life, then go to Jesus. If you're looking for eternal hope, go to Jesus. Because he is God. It is 11.06 a.m., that is right. Good to know. I, I'm running out of time. We're all running out of time. <laughs> See what I did there? We are. That's right. And thank you for that. You know what? You're running out of time. Well, you say, well, I'll do that later. Have you ever heard that? I'll come to Jesus later. Right? <laughs> really? So you're going to waste your whole life in wandering? You're going to drink wells full of poison until you finally turn on your deathbed to drink from the river of life? Really? Often those who kick the eternal can down the road never get to kick it again because they're kicking the can before. You want to waste your life? You want to hurt yourself? You want to live unsatisfyingly? Is that how you want to live? What are you thirsty for? And we have to ask God to give us even that thirst. In our depravity, we can't even come to Him because we cannot see Him because we are blind. But the light has come. Give me this water, woman at the well. Give me this river of life. So when Jesus stands up and says what he said, he's saying he is God. And what you thirst for determines where you drink from. You either Seize Jesus to throw him down or serve Jesus to lift him up. Where are you at, Jack? What is happening here? Think about that. I'm asking you to think about that. Repent if you need to and turn or rejoice because you are and continue Going forward. Jesus will not be ignored. These questions matter. How you live now and where you'll live in eternity. Now in this, verse 45, we continue Says, saying this, finally, then, at this moment, the temple guards, those who were sent by the Pharisees, what did they do? They went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, McFly, yo, where's Jesus? We told you to go get him. Why didn't you bring him in? Look at their response. It's okay. <laughs> they, they said, no one ever spoke the way this man does. No one has spoken like him. And these guys have heard the Pharisees drone on and on and on and on. <laughs> like some people on platforms, right? <laughs> That's the biggest amen I got, right? Hey, man, brother, I'm hungry. <laughs> you guys are great. This is a very fun place to, to speak. Yay. <laughs> they said, no one's ever spoke the way this man does. <laughs> These are guys who were employed to do the will of the temple 
couldn't do it because of his teaching. They're like, we ain't doing that. Putting their job on the line, putting their reputation on the line, putting their families potentially on the line. Verse 47, the Pharisees mocked, saying, you mean he's deceived you also, you morons? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him, those of us who are educated, those of us who know better? You see any of us running towards him, do you? Do you see that? You don't, do you, right? No, right? But this mob, right? Some really bunch of people, they know nothing. They know nothing of the law. There's a curse on them because of their ignorance, but not in us, yo. Now, John adds this in here, and this is like hilarious the irony of this. Verse 50 Nicodemus, right? Remember Nicodemus, Nick at night, John chapter 3. Nicodemus, we see him at the end. He believed one of the rulers. Now, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, right, who was one of their number, <laughs> John points out, asks, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him or finding out what he has been doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it. And you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Now, here's the last question. Whose glory are you seeking? Okay. And this is how I come to that question from this passage. Right? So John concludes this section by focusing on the conversation of the leaders. And these leaders Jesus described as seeking glory from one another... And they do not seek the glory that comes from only God. So this group were glory seekers of themselves. They wanted people to see how smart they were, how holy they were. They wanted to be noticed. They wanted to be the one that was the center of attention. And when the attention was turned away from them to Jesus, who it should properly turn to, they got mad because they didn't want God's glory. Even though they were serving God, they didn't want God's glory, but people's esteem, Right? These guys were only seeking glory for themselves. They were not or could not judge correctly. So why do people misjudge, misjudge God and others? Because they want glory more than they want truth. That was an important statement, right? People misjudge God and others because they want to be correct, they want to be right, they want people to look at them, how smart they are, how good they are, how godly they are, how better they are than other people. So those who misjudge God and others want glory more than they want truth, and it happens all the time. Leaders who are trying to maintain their power and get glory they use the law to break the law. Just like these guys. Using the law, bring them in to break the law, right? Not give them a trial. They've already condemned them already. <laughs> they use the tactics that are described in this passage. Look at these things that they use. Those who are looking to maintain their power and get glory. Mocking, name-calling, belittling, judging, cursing, marginalizing, and dismissing all others who oppose them or think different than them. They are self-inflating and have a grandiose opinion of themselves, saying, I am smarter than you, I'm bigger than you, I'm more powerful than you, and you all are a bunch of morons, right? These are the behaviors of those seeking their own glory. Hear me. These are the behaviors of those seeking the glory of people and not the glory of God. 
This is what people who are seeking their own glory do. Happens on national levels, and it happens at the family barbecue, right? People there are beating their chest, thinking how smart they are and how stupid everybody is. Give me another beer. Let me tell you about all the morons in this country. I know it's none of you. Or is it? This happens all the time. (laughs) They're not looking for truth. (laughs) They're seeking their own glory. Truth doesn't matter anymore. It's about me being right and everyone else being morons. Right? And again, this is so funny, right? Here it is, that these guys are thinking they're so smart using the law, and then John brings up Nicodemus and says, hey, 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 right? We have to give him a fair trial, and they're like, oh, okay, all right, well, let me tell you something, Mr. Smarty Pants Nicodemus, look into it. You will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee, right? But here's the deal, and this is so funny and ironic, That if they themselves looked into it, there was a prophet who came out of Galilee. Know what his name was? Jonah. And know what also is ironic? And by the way, they said, well, you know, um, um, the, the Messiah will come out of the city of Bethlehem. Does that sound familiar anywhere? They didn't look into it because they didn't want to know the truth. They wanted to hold their opinion so people would think they're awesome. Fooey. That nonsense. They would have looked into it. They would have saw he was born in Bethlehem. If they would have looked into it, they have known that there's a prophet who comes out of Galilee. And this man, Jonah, by the way, this is the prophet that Jesus called out by name. Right? He says, as they're asking him, well, who do you say you are? He says, I'm going to give you the sign of the prophet Jonah. Right? This is in Matthew, right? It's on the screen. It should be. Sign of the prophet Jonah. It's like, hey, I'm going to give you this sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. This was significant. So I ask you, whose glory are you seeking? If you are seeking your own glory over God's truth, you will compromise all the time. Oh, I don't want to say that because that will hurt these guys and and they won't like me or won't accept me in this group. Hey, you know what? I don't want to do that thing because I don't want people to know and blah, 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 blah. But it's easy to fall into. What does this mean then? Judge correctly, not by mere appearances. Look deeply at the facts and the truth and make your judgment. So again, in conclusion, I ask you, More importantly, Scripture and the Holy Spirit asks you, who do you think Jesus is? Think about this. What does this mean to you? What do you indeed thirst for? What are you thinking about continually? What are you longing for, striving for? Is it the glory of God or your own glory? Whose glory are you seeking? I'm asking you to deal seriously with these questions. And repent if you need to. Rejoice and be encouraged in other places. 
come to Jesus and drink. And so we're going to pray. We're going to conclude with a song right on time. And perhaps you say, hey, you know what? I need to spend a little time praying today. I have a perfect place for you to do that. Ta-da! Right? You can pray here. I'm asking you. You say, well, I, I want to think about it at home. Please think about it at home. Right? Do what you need to do. If you want prayer, I'll be here. Other people will be here. If you want to pray or say, hey, I just, will you, will you pray for me? We'll pray, right? Deal with these questions <laughs> seriously. Now, next week, we're going to continue on. I'm grateful that Tom Douglas will be speaking next week. And if you look on, okay, there's like, what do we do with this passage about um, the couple caught in adultery that's there, and there's some notes there. Tom is a perfect guy to talk to this, what this means. Really, in an example, by the way, that's why it's there, inserted there, to contrast the judgment of Jesus from the judgment of the law givers. Okay. We're looking at that next week, and I encourage you to think on it as well. But now we're going to pray. So I'm going to pray. If you want prayer during this song, come on up or afterwards, come on up and see me. I'll camp out right here and we can pray. So let's do that. God, thank you for these people who have you have gathered here today. God, as we pray, Lord, I ask that our hearts have been and will be open. Whatever each of us needs to hear God highlight it again for us. Jesus, you indeed are the Christ, the Son of God. I, we believe in you. Through you, we receive life in your name. Grateful that we have your word. Grateful that we can gather together. Grateful for your spirit working among us. Grateful for your promises of yet to come. Grateful that you are with us to the very end of the age. We are grateful. Help us, God, to live in that. To drink from the fountain of life. To be emboldened by your spirit. May the gospel penetrate our life, penetrate our family, transform this community and reach the world. Thank you for the invitation to come and a drink. We indeed need you. Amen. Amen.